Okay, so here's part two. Part two, if we're talking about the French, or the French here, and of course, Hundred Years' War, uh, and of uh, the Hundred Years' War, moving on forward from this. And we look at Henry V, okay? When Henry V comes in, uh, he is... Uh, reasserted again, House Lancaster reasserted to the French throne, or he claims the French throne, going back to the original reasons, uh, if you look at when he ruled in 1412, the original reasons, literally 50 years earlier, of why this war began, okay, and, but Henry's going to take a different different approach to this. He's going to take another group of people, the the, Burgun, the Burgundians under the Dukes of Burgundy, and he's going to bring them into the fold because, you know, they're there on the border of the Holy Roman Empire and uh, Eastern France, and they are a different type of people as well, and they don't want to be under French control. They're much more in line with what is going on in England, okay? So Henry V, with the support of the Burgundians, are able to control Paris, Normandy, northern France, the area that is much closer to England, much closer to Burgund uh, Burgundy and the Burgundians uh, along that English Channel North Sea area, okay? And again, we're talking ebb and flow, ebb and flow, ebb and flow. Here's the ebb and flow where the English really have control once again. Okay, but we've got a long way to go in this war. The French pride is going to kick back into high gear here in a second. Um, in a second, I mean in a few years. And we're going to move on with this war. All right, so you can see the Burgundian presence and what I'm talking about. You can see the English control. It's really, really diminishing the French control, okay, and where Bur Burgundy is here on the eastern side. I mean, it's closing in on France, uh, and it's almost like surefire success for both the Burgundians and the British as we move, or the English as we move uh, longer into this war. But, of course, that's not going to be the case. Whoops. Went too fast. Got a little stuck on the button there. Okay. Uh, the Treaty of Troyes, 1420. Again, another break in the battle, break in the war. All right. And again, it's about legitimacy. Taking Henry V, okay, who is a English king, and he now marries the daughter of the French king. Okay, and it's bringing together the legitimacy that Henry, when Charles VI dies, uh, he's going to be the king of France. Okay, but as you can see here in your notes, we've got a problem because both they both of them died in 1422, and that treaty is going to become null and void. Uh, a new king is going to take over Henry VI. He's going to get both both thrones, um, but he's an infant. I mean, what's going to get accomplished here? So again, legitimacy, heirs to the throne, land claims, who's in control. We kind of reassert ourselves once again as we move forward with this war, and the war is going to crank back up, okay? Um, so here you can see another, another pretty good map of the height of English dominance. You can see the land that's under control. You can see the borders. Uh, this is Burgundian area. This is English control, all right? It's very much kind of... Uh, forcing the French um, and, and losing their their power. Okay, you can you can definitely see that this is going to be so. We're near the end. We're really close to the end, but it's not going to be the end because there's going to be a flip. There's going to be a change. There's going to be something that drives the French to success. Okay, uh, so and you have a reconquest. And the, what's going to drive that French to success is Joan of Arc. Okay, nothing like a young 14, 15 year old teenage girl having visions of saints coming to her and basically saying, Joan, you are going to save the French people. Go convince Charles VII that you are going to save the French. Let take his army. And he does. He lets her have the army. He makes her. He She dresses like a man. She gets control. Now think about this. You guys are 17, 18 years old. Could you control an entire army right now? Ladies, would you be willing to guess, dress up in armor and go and fight right now to fight for national pride, to lead the French army, which by the way is losing, against the British, your hated enemy, and be successful? And get very experienced soldiers to follow you. It's an amazing thought. And Charles the Seventh. I mean, what's he have to lose? All right, what is he able to? What's he have to lose? He, he they're losing the war anyway. But he wants to reconquer and reconquest, get reconquest of France, and he gives her the army. 
Now understand, Joan of Arc's born in Burgundy, and she is very much French. Okay, she does not like the English control. She does not like this presence in her home area, and she comes from a wealthy family, a relatively wealthy, not nobility by any means, but someone who has some wealth. And these visions drive her. They drive her personality. They drive her military tactics. People follow her. And she's successful. She becomes a thorn in the British side. Okay? So here she is. She gets control. She goes in and does this, this power move. And, and she leads these men into battle. And there's going to be success at Orleans, one of the major cities that's captured by the British. She's able to reconquest and get it back. Show the king, Charles VII, that she has it. Next to Orleans is Paris. You regain the capital city, you have major, major success. All right. So Joan is now elevated to this hero in France. That builds national pride, nationalism. You know, we're moving into that time period where the Renaissance is going to crank up and the Reformation is going to eventually crank up and exploration is going to go on and nationalism and the creation of nation states is coming together. And that starts to happen here. You know, the French and English have been in each other's throats for so many years, but really with the advent of Joan of Arc, it's starting to come together. And the movements over the next five centuries, from the late 15th century into the 20th century, are going to be centered around it. All right? It's inspiration. It's taking control. She puts the king back into power. Of course, she's captured by the English. And what do the English do? Well, they force her to go back to being or dressing and acting like a woman. They don't treat her like a commander or a leader of an army. They treat her like a woman who has done wrong. They burn her for heresy. They rape her. They put her on trial, which she cannot win. Okay? But what all they're doing is making her a martyr. The Catholic Church will definitely canonize her when the time comes and make her St. Joan of Arc. She is the national symbol of France. And though, even though she is gone, the resistance continues on. The nationalism that is built up by what she did continues on. And that's going to spread throughout France. Okay. Now, this is a more of a World War I type picture, and we can discuss this in class. But how is feminism? Now, we're looking at the 15th century, folks. And women are second nature. How is she a symbol of feminism? We can discuss that in class. Okay. So, um, the French continued on. Okay. And they are... Slowly but surely. I mean, you're looking at the time period here, 1453. I mean, that's a good 21 years after the death of Joan of Arc. She is the inspiration for the French to reconquer and reconquer. And they're going to get back their land. They're going to get back what was theirs. Everything except for Calais right down on the border. Uh, that's going to be the passageway between England and France. But they are going to get France back. And not only get France back, but eradicate, get rid of the British, get incorporate the Burgundians, bring in Burgundy into France, and ultimately, which is the most important part as we move forward, that what makes the Valois family, uh, the dynasty continue and move on into the Bourbon family, is the unification. France is unified. They are one unified, controlled nation under the French king. And you can see here, okay, the area of Burgundy on the east, Flanders, which will eventually become Belgium in this area, but this is now parts of France. They go back under French control. And the separation between England and France has actually happened. Now, England and France are going to have to deal with each other much differently as time goes on, but you go to that separation of the two countries and the national pride. Now, England's going to have its national pride too, don't forget. They're going to go through a War of the Roses. All right, they're going to have issues with control, and eventually the Tudor family will come into place in the 15th century and into the 16th century. And of course, that's Henry VIII and the Tudors, Queen, uh, you know, Bloody Mary, and all them. And that's coming later. But no, England has been defeated. France is unified. England's going to have to rise up, and you're going to see this movement 
and this power hungry, this power control of these European countries. And oh, by the way, don't forget about the Holy Roman Empire. That's coming down the road too.